Hi everybody, I'm Shelly and you're watching There's No Place Like Home. I'm back with another question and narrative video. And today's topic is let's talk about preterism. Now I'm going to admit to you that if I sound frustrated during this video, it's because of my laptop. I just spent two hours recording this video and suddenly it froze and deleted the video and I am now starting from scratch. So, phew, deep breaths. So anyway, a couple of weeks ago, I mentioned that I was planning on sharing my preliminary views on preterism with you because I've been looking into it a bit. And then I saw that a couple of channels that I subscribed to recently, just like, just like within the last couple of days, posted videos on preterism. And I thought, oh, great. Well, then I'm not going to do this now because people are going to think that I'm copying. So I just took a look at the comments on the videos. I didn't watch either of them. And I realized just from reading the comments that the views of these channels are very, very different from my own. And the way that they approached the whole thing is very different on my own. So I thought, you know what? I'm just going to do this video. So that's what I'm doing today. Because it seems like when it comes to preterism, there are two camps that we are hearing from. We are hearing from the preterists. So those who are already identifying in that camp. And then we are hearing from those who are against preterism and just really seem to be very angry about the whole idea of preterism and very uncomfortable. And so that's what it seems like people are, are, how they're being introduced to preterism is either one side or the other. So I thought, you know what? I'm kind of in the middle. I'm still exploring it. I think it's an interesting topic. So I'm going to try to share what I've learned about preterism with you. And I'm going to try to do it without any preconceived notions. Like I'm not going into this feeling one way or the other about it. I just want to know the truth, you know, and that's really, that's, that's the way that I even used to approach flat earth when I first came upon that, you know, when I first saw a flat earth video, I didn't get mad or angry and think, oh my gosh, it's a doctrine of devils. No, I just thought, huh, I wonder how people can think that. And that was when, that was how I started looking in the flat earth and lo and behold, I saw that it had merit. Same thing with preterism. You know, I had never really heard of what preterism was until a few years ago. And it was only recently that I really started looking into it. And I'm like, huh, I wonder how people can think that. And if you don't know what preterism is, that would probably be helpful. Preterism, whether you're talking about partial preterism or full preterism, is the idea that either most or all of revelation has already been fulfilled. And so coming at it, especially in the full preterism point of view, that's when I was like, huh, I wonder how people can think that. And that's how I'm approaching this today. Before we get started, there are two verses that I want to share with you about humility. When pride comes, disgrace follows, but with humility comes wisdom. That's Proverbs 11.2. James 4, 6 says, and he gives grace generously. As the scriptures say, God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. The reason that I'm sharing this is because I'm finding that there are many, many, many believers, including myself sometimes, that lack humility when we are researching things that don't necessarily line up with our views. And unfortunately, this is something that I found um, in the comments, at least, because again, I didn't watch the videos of people when it comes to preterism. I saw people calling it the doctrine of devils or the doctrine of demons. I saw people saying that it was going to send people to hell. And that's not okay. Because first of all, what is, what is what are the doctrine of devils? Real doctrines of devils are those that undermine the finished work of the cross. Preterism does not do that. Real doctrines of devils 
are those that deny the, de the deity of Christ. Preterism doesn't do that. Real doctrines of devils are those that deny Christ altogether. Preterism doesn't do that either. Doctrines of devils are those proclaiming that there is more than one way of salvation. Preterism does not do that either. I think it's very, very important to be careful about what you're calling doctrines of devils. If you are calling things doctrines of devils that are still proclaiming the gospel and are glorifying God, then you need to pray for humility if you're feeling like you need to name call in that way. Because preterism is not, no, it, it does none of those things. It upholds and proclaims the gospel message and the gift of salvation, period. So with that being said, I do not agree with full preterism. I don't, but I'm going to approach this as best I can. And if there are already preterists um, who are watching and you see that I've gotten something wrong, please leave a comment because I think that truth is very important. It's important to be clear because I'm afraid that many people who are learning about preterism are not actually learning it from preterists themselves, but are learning it from people who don't like preterism and are kind of giving their spin on it. And I think it's important that we learn about what preterists believe from the actual preterists and not from their critics. I found this article about, about preterism and I thought that I would share most of it here with you because it makes a lot of sense. And from what I've been seeing, I think that people need to understand this. It says, while everyone rightfully focuses more on the historicity and biblical validity of the four eschatology views of the millennium, all millennialism, post-millennialism, historic millennialism, and dispensational premillennialism. There is another set of four eschatological possibilities that people often forget about or are unaware of. I'm referring to the four ways of interpreting revelation, preterism, idealism, historicism, and futurism, which directly affect how we interpret the rest of the prophecies of scripture. Preterism is the view that teaches most prophecies in Scripture, including Daniel 9, 24 to 27, Zechariah 14, 1 through 5, Matthew 24, 1 to 35, and the Beast of Revelation 13, have been fulfilled in the past, specifically in the first Jewish-Roman War that took place in AD 66 to 74, with a special emphasis on the siege of Jerusalem in AD 70. While the early church leaders were not unanimous on this subject, they rarely are on any subject, something to keep in mind when, dis when discussing church history, there is strong historical support for preterism. One example is that many of the early church fathers believed the 77s of Daniel, including the frequently debated 70th week of Daniel and its abomination of desolation, were fulfilled in the first century. Eusebius of Caesarea says uh, in the book Church History, and this is from Eusebius lived A.D. 260 to 340. The number of calamities which everywhere fell upon the nation at that time, the extreme misfortunes to which the inhabitants of Judea were especially subjected, the thousands of men as well as women and children that perished by the sword, by famine, and by other forms of death innumerable, all these things, as well as the many great sieges which were carried on against the cities of Judea and the excessive sufferings endured by those who fled to Jerusalem itself, as to a city of perfect safety, and finally the general course of the whole war, as well as its particular occurrences in detail, and how at last the abomination of desolation, proclaimed by the prophets, stood in the very temple of God, so celebrated of old, the temple which was now awaiting its total and final destruction by fire. All these things anyone that wishes may find accurately described in the history written by Josephus. I'm not going to read all of these. I'm just going to skim through these because I, I have some pretty long articles to share with you today and we'll be here all night if I read all of them. I always link all the articles in the description box. So if you want to read everything that they have to say. They're all right there in my description box. 
Next, though, I'm going to, going to read another one by Eusebius in Church History. He said, It is fitting to add to their accounts the true predictions of our Savior, in which he foretold these very events of Jerusalem's destruction. His words are as follows, Woe unto them who are with child, and to them who give suck in those days. Pray that you flight not be in the winter, neither on the Sabbath day, for there shall be great tribulation, such as was not since the beginning of the world to this time. No, nor ever shall be. Epiphanius in Panarian Book 1 said, after the exodus from Jerusalem, all the disciples went to live in, Pe in Peia because Christ had told them to leave Jerusalem and to go away since it would undergo a siege. Because of this advice, they lived in Perea after moving to that place, as I said. Even Zechariah 14, which is often lauded as irrefutable proof of unfulfilled prophecy concerning Jerusalem, was fulfilled already in the eyes of some early church fathers. After the first siege of Jerusalem in 586 BC and its total destruction by the Babylonians, and after the return of the Jews from their enemy's land to their own, which came to pass in the time of Cyrus, king of Persia, when Jerusalem has just been restored and the temple and its altar renewed by Darius the Persian, the present prophecy, Zechariah 14, foretells a second siege of Jerusalem, which is to take place afterwards, which it offered from the Romans, which it, sorry, which it suffered from the Romans after its inhabitants had carried through their outrage on our Savior Jesus Christ. Thus, the coming of the Savior and the events connected therewith are very clearly shown in this passage. I mean, what was done at the time of his passion and the siege that came on the Hebrew race directly after the taking of Jerusalem, the call of the Gentiles also, and the knowledge attained by the nations of the one and only God. That was Eusebius in demonstration of the gospel book six. Lastly, there is the eschatological antichrist who most today in American Christianity believe is a future figure. However, there were some church fathers in the past who viewed him as an ancient figure, Nero Caesar, including Jerome. As for the Antichrist, there is no question that he is going to fight against the Holy Covenant, and that when he first makes war against the king of Egypt, he shall straightway be frightened off by the assistance of the Romans. But these events were typically prefigured under Antiochus Epiphanes, so that this abominable king who persecuted God's people foreshadowed the Antichrist, who is to persecute the people of Christ. So, there are many of our viewpoint who think that Nero Caesar was the Antichrist because of his outstanding savagery and depravity. And that was a commentary by Jerome on Daniel 11, 27 to 30. The early church was rarely unanimous on theology, especially eschatology. But one of the common views among the most prolific church fathers was preterism, the teaching that most biblical prophecies were fulfilled by the end of the first century, including Matthew 24, Zechariah 14, Daniel 9, and Revelation 13. These prominent teachers included Eusebius, Athanasius, Jerome, and Epiphanius, who taught that these texts were fulfilled by the cruelty of Nero, the desolation of the temple by Titus, and the destruction of Jerusalem by the Romans from A.D. 64 to A.D. 70. Therefore, preterism is a historically viable eschatological position, rivaling futurism for the most impressive historical pedigree. Sola Deo Gloria. So when we look at these different eschatological views, we need to be very careful of condemning those people who believe differently than we do, saying that they are believing doctrines of devils or that their eschatological views are going to send them to hell. That is not where we get our salvation from. We get our salvation from accepting the finished work of the cross, not from our eschatological views. I think it's very important that we say that. And as to the, all of the differing views of eschatology, please don't forget the disciples were confused and they were there with Jesus in his presence bodily. They were there with him and they were even confused. So to think that you have somehow figured everything out and you couldn't possibly be wrong and everyone else who disagrees with you, there's something wrong with them. 
again, I'm going to say it. You need to pray for humility. So when it comes to partial preterism and full preterism, the, the main difference is that full preterism believes that all of Revelation has been fulfilled, including the white throne judgment, and that we are now currently living on the new earth and there is a new heaven. Like it, it, is, it is finished, so to speak. That's what I like to call full preter preterism. It is finished. Okay, that's how I kind of think of it. Partial preterism, though, doesn't believe necessarily all the way up through there. It believes that much of Revelation has been fulfilled, but not all of it. Now, many people don't know that one of the most famous theologians of our time, R.C. Sproul, he admitted to being a partial preterist. And he said that he believed that all of Revelation up to Revelation 20, 21 has already been fulfilled. Now, it's hard to give a really good synopsis on, it's hard to give a really good synopsis on what partial preterists believe because there are so many different camps. There are so many different ways to interpret um, what parts of Revelation have already happened and what haven't happened. I believe that some of them may be amillennials, some postmillennials. And yes, one of the most common, I don't know if these people would consider themselves to be to be partial preterists, but those who believe that we are now living in the short season would certainly fall under partial preterists. Because living in the full season, everything up to and including at least half of Revelation 20 would have to have already finished. And even with those who believe in the short season, there are many different theories on when Christ actually returned and when the millennial kingdom happened, how it happened. Was it here spiritually? Was it here physically? Lots of differing thoughts on that. So even within that little camp of partial preterism, there's not complete agreement because again, this is something that is not very clear. It just isn't. No matter how much we would like it to be clear, it's not. Now, common thought I know in the short season community is that Christ returned around the around AD 70, the fall of Jerusalem. And many people who believe that we are now in the short season interpret, if not a literal thousand year reign, something very similar to, or not similar, something signifying a very long period of time. So maybe not necessarily the whole thousand years, but close to a thousand years. And then also there's the whole idea that a thousand years have also been inserted into our timeline, or maybe between, I'll say between 500 to a thousand years to cover up the fact that Christ already returned and the millennial kingdom already happened. So that is another view of those who believe in the short season. And again, not all partial preterists believe that we are living in the short season now. So you really have, it just, it just depends on who you're asking. So right now, I would have to say that I fall into a partial preterism point of view. I definitely, yeah, I, I believe that we are very likely in Revelation 20 right now. I'm not sure. And I'm not going to say that with any sense of certainty, because there could always be new evidence that comes about that has me scratching my head. But at this point in time, that's where I'm at. Full preterism, however, does seem to make a lot of sense in certain aspects, but I have certain issues with it as well. Now, I want to point out that I am not going to get into every aspect of preterism in this video. I just thought it was important to give a basic overview of what preterism is. And then I'm hoping to make many videos about preterism just so that you can have a more detailed look at specific aspects because I know that people are going to be asking me specific questions about preterism and I, I'm just going to say I'm not an expert. I yeah far from being an expert. I'm just somebody who kind of I, I want to give a more neutral point of view on preterism because what I'm seeing, especially coming from the one side, is not pretty, and it's not becoming of believers. 
So when it comes to full preterism, I'm just going to give a very basic overview of what they believe that is different than the partial preterists. And again, I'm not going to go very deeply into these things. I'm just going to basically list them for you today. I might share some stuff on some of it, but I'm again, these are things that would be for future videos because if I would share details on everything, I would be here for days recording videos and I definitely don't even want to do that now. After I already spent an hour or two doing the video before this that got lost on my lovely laptop. But anyway, so one of the differences is that full preterists, to my knowledge, again, please correct me if I'm wrong if you are a preterist and you are watching this, full preterists generally believe that the millennium began at Christ's ascension. So after he was resurrected, he was with the disciples for 40 days. And then when he ascended, that was the beginning of the millennial kingdom. And they believe that the millennium was, and again, I, I'm going off of the website that I've been reading. Okay. It, it could vary. I know that it does. There are some full preterists who believe that the millennial kingdom actually was only about 40 years, which I know I'm going to have people in the comments about that. But first of all, I just want to point out something that Michael Heiser said in this article. He said, all millennial thinkers note rightly that the 1000 year language describing the millennial period in Revelation 20 can be taken figuratively. So the thousand year period isn't a specific thousand year cycle on an actual calendar. Instead, with his resurrection and ascension, Christ began his reign. And in all millennial thinking, he presently rules on earth through his people, and he will return physically at any moment to usher in heaven on earth. So here is a very good example of a well-respected believer, Michael Heiser, who is telling us that, yes, Revelation 20 can be taken, well, the millennial period, I should say, can be taken figuratively. That does not mean that he is a heretic. That does not mean that he is believing doctrines of demons. It means that he is looking at this from a different perspective than you, something that really can be an enigma to many people. So it's not unheard of to take the thousand years figuratively instead of literally. I have to say that, you know, this literal taking of the thousand years really came about when the pre-millennium movement started. Paul from Understanding Conspiracy did a fantastic video on this in which he was showing that this Jesus movement that happened in the 1970s, that was when pre-millennialism just blew up. Before that time, you really didn't hear much about premillennialism. It was more like amillennialism or postmillennialism. You didn't really hear anything about the millennial kingdom until that time. So I think it's important to say that 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 is that has not the the millennial or the premillennial uh, point of view doesn't seem to have been the prevailing point of view for for history. It it seems to have really picked up steam in the 1970s. So I'm going to share some of this article with you from Revelations and Grace. Again, this is a really good website. He's done so much work on this. It's very well written. It's very well researched. Lots of citations, biblical citations mainly. Um, so yeah, check this out. There's so much to read on it. it. Yeah, I could be here forever. But anyway, I want to explain their position on the millennium and the, the, just the time that it takes. The previous chapter demonstrated that the millennium began with Christ's ascension into heaven. But when would it end? In 1030 AD, which is a literal thousand years, or is it still happening today? Many scholars recognize that John's thousand years was a symbolic number. Is this true? The reader should notice that the events expected to occur at the end of the thousand years were all promised a soon fulfillment. 
Bible uses hyperbole. Logically, one might think the millennium represents 1,000 literal years or at least a very long period of time. Most would hesitate to imagine it could mean a much shorter time span, say 30 to 40 years. However, the Bible frequently uses hyperbole to emphasize the greatness of an act, even if it is technically exaggerated. Nations surrounding Israel used hyperbolic numbers to glorify their kings, so the Israelites did the same to glorify God. And I'm just going to scroll down here. Jewish rabbis and Christians living in Jesus' time believed the world was divided into seven figurative millennia corresponding to the seven days of creation. The Messianic age was the sixth millennia, and when God's kingdom arrived, it would mark the beginning of the seventh millennium, or cosmic Sabbath, an eternal period. The early church father, Irenaeus, writing in 175 to 185 AD, says, For in as many days as this world was made, in so many thousand years shall it be concluded. And for this reason the scripture says, Thus the heaven and the earth were finished, and all their adornment. And God brought to a conclusion upon the sixth, the sixth day the works that he had made. And God rested upon the seventh day from all his works. Genesis 2.2 2. This is an account of the things formerly created, as also it is a prophecy of what is to come. For the day of the Lord is as a thousand years. 2 Peter 3.8 And in six days created things were completed. It is evident, therefore, that they will come to an end at the 6,000th year. These are to take place in the times of the kingdom. That is upon the seventh day, which has been sanctified, in which God rested from all the works which he created, which is the true Sabbath of the righteous. A thousand years refer to the entire length of each age, and some scholars argued that the sixth millennia would last much less than a thousand years. They called these days the days of the Messiah and expected them to be a transition period between the former ages and the eternal age to come. Um, Edward E. Stevens, in his unpublished PDF, What the Rabbi Said About the Millennium, noticed that some Jewish scholars in the first century even argued this eon would last only 40 years. Stevens quotes Abraham Stevens quotes Abraham Cohen's work, which stated, Many rabbis believe that the period of the Messiah was to be only a transitory stage between this world and the world to come, and opinions differed on its duration. So how long will the days of the Messiah last? Here we see 40 years, 100 years, and these are, these are rabbis, 600 years, 400 years, 1,000 years, 7,000 years. So it there are so many different points of view on this. I will, I will leave a link to this in the description because then it shows us that after this, what, after this millennium, which they do believe was only 40 years, they believe that the second resurrection happened in AD 66 or around AD 70. And I will get into that. In, in, in a moment, but I just want to go over this with you. Besides the symbolic nature of the thousand year reign, it should be noted that the end of the millennium was expected soon. Four universe changing and unrepeatable events happen at its end. Heaven casts Satan, yeah, heaven casts Satan into the lake of fire. That is a problem that I have with full millennium, full, sorry, not full millennium, full preterism. Because, and I know that there is much sin in the world. I know that pe people are sinful just to the core. However, I also know that there are still demonic possessions. I know that there are still hauntings. I know that there are still what people call UFO abductions, which, you know, I'm fairly certain are, if, if not demons themselves, demonic in nature. I, I experienced um, a haunted house that I once lived in. So I actually did ask the, I believe it was the author of this article because this, this blog does have a YouTube channel as well. And I commented and asked about this and he just basically said that he thinks that the hauntings and spiritual 
events and everything are just kind of in people's heads. But I can tell you from my own personal experience, it's not. If if you've seen my other video on my experience with, experiences with this, then you already know. But one great example for those of you who don't know is that I lived in a house that had many, many, many things happen to me. And finally, at one point, I went out to the neighbors and told them, because they were standing outside, they used to stand outside and talk all the time. So I crossed the street and went over and I told them what was going on. They all looked at each other with this, like, with these knowing smiles on their faces. And they said, we wondered when you were going to say something to us. Because this is something that they were aware of because it happened to the person who lived there before me. That's not something that can just be in your head if it also happened to someone that you have never even met. So, yes, this is one of the, this is probably the biggest issue that I have with full preterism. And I haven't really been able to find an explanation that reconciles it. So then we have death is thrown into the lake of fire. Now, many people believe that on the new earth, there will be no death. They make a very good argument for that there, there will be death. When it says no more death, it's actually referring to the new heavens. Because when we are in heaven, we are still alive. We're just, we're not alive in this body that we are in now. But when we pass away, it's like going through a doorway. You know, you leave one, one realm, you go to the next. So that is what no more death means. Because as of right now, death is the grave. Or at least in Old Testament times, death was the grave. That was death. Being in Sheol and then waiting for judgment. So they believe that God already resurrected the wicked dead and he already judged the dead. So those things, full preterism believes, already happen. And yes, and so with that also is the, the new heavens and the new earth. That is another issue that I have with full preterism is I, I'm not confident that I, I understand. And yes, there is that verse in Revelation 22 that says about the sinners sitting outside of New Jerusalem. And I'm thinking, hmm, well, that doesn't seem to make sense. I thought that there weren't going to be, you know, sin then. But it, it, it appears there will be sin on the new earth. It, there will not be sin in the new heaven. This is, these are my opinions. These are the way that I'm taking things. Um. So I understand that there will be these, these issues, but again, it's related to what I was talking about with the spiritual warfare, the spiritual things going on. We can see these things happening all around us, all of the symbolism in Hollywood. You know, we, we can see what seem to be these celebrities transforming on stage and almost seem, seeming to be possessed as they are performing. So these are things that we all witness for ourselves. And yes, people can say, well, those are in your head too. But I just don't, again, my opinion, I have a hard time reconciling that the new earth could have so much evil on it still. But again, it could just be that my understanding is skewed. So I, yeah, I'm still looking into it and I'm still trying to find, you know, a an explanation for that. So I'm certain that I'm going to get some comments about New Jerusalem, that if the new heavens and new earth were already here, we would see New Jerusalem. And one theory is that, you know, I have always said that I believe that it's the throne of God that we see as the Aurora Borealis. But some people have said that that could be the lights of the New Jerusalem. And that could certainly be the case. You know, I don't know. However, I do as I was reading through Revelation again a few weeks ago, I noticed this. So specifically Revelation 21.10, but I'm going to read the context. It says, Then one of the seven angels with the seven bowls full of the seven final plagues came and said to me, Come, I will show you the bride, the wife of the Lamb. And he carried me away in the spirit to a mountain great and high and showed me the holy city of Jerusalem coming down out of heaven from God, shining with the glory of God. Its radiance was like a most precious jewel, like a jasper, as clear as crystal. So I want you to especially look at this part here. He carried me away in the spirit. So 
is it possible that we will only be able to actually visibly see the new Jerusalem once we have passed from this life to the next in our spiritual form? Is that how we will be able to visibly see the new Jerusalem? It's just a thought that I have, just an idea. I also know that I'm going to get questions about, well, how, why are you saying that Jesus already came back? Well, I'm going to go back to the other website. And yes, I'm using this website because, again, I think it's important to learn about preterism from preterists because it just seems to make sense, right? So this one is called, Does Jesus Promise to Return in His Generation? In the previous article, Does God Use Soon the Way We Do?, we uncover some remarkable history that might just prove Jesus is seen coming on the clouds in 66 AD. And despite the popular saying, we discover that God uses soon the way we think of it and rebukes those who say it can mean thousands of years in the book of Ezekiel. This begs the question, does Jesus ever promise to return soon? Jesus gives a time frame for his return. In several places, Jesus gives a time frame for his return. Matthew 16, 27 to 28, For the Son of Man is about to come in the glory, his Father with his angels, and then he will give to each according to his deeds. Truly I say to you, there are some of those standing here who shall not taste of death until they have seen the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. Matthew 24, 34, Truly I tell you, this generation will certainly not pass away until all these things have happened. I know people will say that generation means nation or race. Uh, this, I don't know if it's this article or another one that this website does, and they clearly explain and give the original translation explaining why that is not what that means. It means this generation that he was speaking to at that time. Luke 21, 35 to 36, for it will come on all those who live on the face of the whole earth. Be always on the watch and pray that you may be able to escape all that is about to happen and that you may be able to stand before the Son of Man. I'm just going to skim through because there are pretty many. Matthew 26, 64, you have said so, Jesus replied, but I say to all of you, from now on, you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of the Mighty One and coming on the clouds of heaven. We'll read Mark 8, 38. For whoever is ashamed of me and of my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of him will be the Son of Man also be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. So, and then it gives four different possibilities for why Jesus will be talking about a soon return. Well, the first is that he uses false expectations. And he does that to motivate perpetual eager preparedness and that every generation should believe Jesus is coming in their generation. God cannot lie or break his oath. Jesus doesn't know when he will come and wrongfully assumes the time frame of his return. Can Jesus be wrong? I know God delays his plans because Israel rejects him and he worries too many will be lost if he returns on time. It's as though God can change his plans. He cannot break his oaths. And after promising to return within their generation, he swears not to delay his plans. God tells the Israelites that delaying and keeping their oath is sin and God cannot sin since God uses delay the way we think of it. Waiting 2,000 years to return is definitely considered a delay. And then the last one is that we misunderstand or mistranslate him. And that is what I believe it is. The funny thing about it is that I saw someone on one of the comments for one of those videos refer to preterism as being esoteric. And to me, it's the exact opposite of esoteric because it's about reading the Bible and taking it for what it actually says at face value. For example, the verses where Jesus is telling his disciple that these things, his disciples, that these things are going to happen in this generation, meaning in their generation, these things would happen. So we're taught to believe most of the time in church that, oh, well, he, he was talking about us in the future too. 
but that's not, if you actually take away all of your preconceived notions and just read the Bible for what it says, he certainly appears to be saying these things specifically to his disciples who were there with him. If we would be reading something very similar in another book, okay, where they were saying the same things, we would automatically assume he was speaking to the people standing there with him. So to me, something that is conditioned to be believed is more esoteric than just breaking, not breaking, <laughs> reading the Bible for what it says. You know, that's one thing, that's one problem that I had as a new believer. And even before I became a believer, I'm like, but he said he would come. It's been all these thousands of years. Why has Jesus not come yet? That's an issue that I had. And it's also an issue that many unbelievers will have. They will bring it up and they will use that as ammunition. And then, you know, as an, as a child or as a new believer, they would say, oh, that's because he was speaking to us through this. And I would always think to myself, but it doesn't sound like that to me. And I'm thinking now it's because he was speaking specifically to the people who were standing there with him. So this also goes into what generation can mean, because there are a couple different explanations for what he means by generation to kind of explain this away. And it says, it's argued this generation should be understood as that generation or the generation that sees these signs, meaning that whatever generation sees the end time signs will not pass until all the end times prophecies are fulfilled. But their generation does see all the signs of the end times. They do. Peter, Paul, Hebrews, and John tell their audience they are living in the last days and even the last hour because they are witnessing the final signs. Acts 2, 16 to 17 says, but this is what was uttered through the prophet Joel. And in the last days it shall be, God declares, that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy and your young men shall see visions and your old men shall dream. 1 Corinthians 10, 11 says, Now these things happened to them as an example, but they were written down for our instruction, on whom the end of the ages has come. So Paul is saying they were written down for their instruction. He's writing to the Corinthians. And he is saying that on them, the end of the ages has come. Hebrews 1, 1 to 2. Long ago, at many times and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son, whom he appointed the heir of all things, through whom also he created the world. 1 John 2.18 Children, it is the last hour, and as you have heard that Antichrist is coming, so now many Antichrists have come. Therefore, we know that it is the last hour. There are multitudes of things like this. I, I don't remember if it was the video from this website or not, but I saw a very good perspective. If, if you read the Gospels, you know, they, they all seemed to be frantically scurrying about telling everyone about Jesus, selling all of their things. We have Paul telling people, you know, if, if you if you can control yourselves, don't get married, you know, now it's not a good idea. And it's because they were, they all were fully expecting the end to come in their lifetime. That is why there was so much urgency because Jesus told them it was going to come in their lifetime. Can this generation mean this race? Others suggest the word generation should be translated as race, suggesting this Hebrew evil or elect race will not pass before Christ returns. Jesus uses this word generation in its most natural sense everywhere else. These are all the verses. The Greek language contains a separate word for race or kind, genos, as used in 1 Peter 2, 9. You are a chosen race. However, the word used in Matthew 24, 34 is genea, which is always translated as the present living generation throughout the entire New Testament and is never used as a kind or species. If Jesus intends to communicate, this race will not pass before he returns. Why does he not use the word genos instead? 
this is another article on the same website and it's called soon means soon and in this he points out how god actually rebukes people for not taking him seriously when when he says that things are going to happen soon so i'm going to start here it's worth noting that daniel's vision was promised to fulfillment in 490 years although we are taught that god sees a day as a thousand years when god communicated with daniel 490 years was considered the distant future and not soon or half a day in God's timing. Furthermore, God predicted the imminent destruction of Jerusalem by the Babylonians, utilizing expressions like has come, is near, has awakened, and soon. And it shows you all the places it says, has gives verbiage of something that is coming up very imminence. That's what I'm looking for. However, when the people of Israel dismissed God's warning as concerning the distant future and not immediate, God rebuked them for disregarding the timing of Ezekiel's prophetic message. I'm going to read this. Ezekiel 12, 21 to 28. And the word of the Lord came to me, son of man, what is this proverb that you have about the land of Israel saying the days grow long and every vision comes to nothing? Tell them, therefore, thus says the Lord God, I will put an end to this proverb, and they shall no more use it as a proverb in Israel. But say to them, the days are near, and the fulfillment of every vision. For there shall be no more any false vision or flattering divination within the house of Israel. For I am the Lord. I will speak the Lord the word that I will speak, and it will be performed. It will no longer be delayed. But in your days, O rebellious house, I will speak the word and perform it, declares the Lord God. And the word of the Lord came to me, son of man, behold, they of the house of Israel say the vision that he sees is for many days from now, and he prophesies of times far off. Therefore say to them, thus says the Lord God, none of my words will be delayed any longer, but the word that I speak will be performed, declares the Lord God. And in summary, it says, actually, I'm just going to read this part here. This rebuke from God demonstrates that he communicates time in human terms and expects, expects us to take him seriously when he does so. In summary, soon means soon. God uses soon the same way humans do. And he rebuked Israel when they denied the obvious meaning of these words. The timing of God's prophecies are just as important as their content. I'm going to point out here, though, this is something as I'm, that I'm noticing as I'm reading this. There does seem to be a bit of a disconnect between this view of soon being soon and then saying that a thousand years could be 40 years. Now, I understand that it's it's the way that the, the millennium were broken down by, by the Hebrews at that time into the seven different millennia and that that's how it was understood by them. But I know that people are going to say that. And I know that is one thing that I noticed, too. Um, but I, I think that there are different contexts for both of them. And again, if you are a preterist and are in the comments, I would love if you could explain that or any of the other issues that I have, you know, with, with full preterism. Okay, so I know that I mentioned before that on this website, you know, they believe that the millennial, the millennium, millennial kingdom, whatever you want to call it, began at Jesus' ascension around, we'll just say 30 AD, and that the the millennium actually ended around 70 AD. And so this is one of the proofs that they use for that. In 66 AD, several trustworthy historians documented sightings of angelic armies engaged in aerial battles shortly after Passover. These accounts provide compelling evidence for Jesus' return during the time of his disciples. The reports describe chariots and soldiers fully armed, running among the clouds and encircling cities. Now, I'm going to point out that many of the partial preterists use this as um, the time that Jesus returned to usher in his kingdom, the, the, the millennial kingdom. However, on this website, this is actually when Jesus is returning for the white throne judgment and to resurrect for the the resurrection the general resurrection so there is there is that difference there one of these reliable historians is josephus a jewish historian who wrote about these events in 75 a.d he states 
Besides these signs, a few days after that feast, on the one and twentieth day of the month, Artemisius, a certain prodigious and incredible phenomenon appeared. I suppose the account of it would seem to be a fable, were it not related by those that saw it, and were not the events that followed it of so considerable a nature as to deserve such signals, for, before sunsetting, chariots and troops of soldiers in their armor were seen running about, running about among the clouds and surrounding of cities. Moreover, at that feast which we call Pentecost, as the priests were going by night into the inner court of the temple, as their custom was to perform their sacred ministrations, they said in the first place they felt a quaking and heard a great noise, and after that they heard a sound as of a great multitude saying, Let us remove hence. Josephus is the most well-known Jewish historian of his time. He was a Jewish priest and general during the war in 67 AD. After receiving a prophetic dream of the Jews' destruction, he promised to serve as a minister of God and surrendered to the Romans. Immediately after, God miraculously delivered him from a life-threatening situation. Josephus later became a historian dedicated to unbiasedly recording the events he witnessed during the war. Churches, historians, preachers, and seminary schools quote and validate his works. Additionally, Tacitus, a Roman senator and historian writing between 100 to 110 AD, mentioned the appearance of angelic armies in the skies. He described battles in the skies, the illumination of the temple by a sudden radiance from the clouds and a voice proclaiming the departure of the gods. Prodigies had occurred, which this, nation, which this nation, prone to superstition but hating all religious rites, did not deem it lawful to expiate by offering and sacrifice. There had been seen hosts joining battle in the skies, the fiery gleam of arms, the temple illuminated by a sudden radiance from the clouds. The doors of the inner shrine were suddenly thrown open, and a voice of more than mortal tone was heard to cry that the gods were departing. At the same instant, there was a mighty stir as of departure. Some few put a fearful meaning on these events, but in most there was a firm persuasion that in the ancient records of their priests was contained a prediction of how at this very time the East was to grow powerful and rulers coming from Judea were to acquire universal empire. And so this continues pretty far down, so I'm not going to read all of it again check it out. I will put all of these in my description box. So many believe that the shaking of the ground that is described is the people coming out of their graves. So then you have to wonder, well, is there, is there any, an eyewitness account of anyone coming out of graves? I know I've been going on about this for quite a while. So I'm just going to share one more thing with you today. And then as I do other videos on preterism, if, if anyone is interested, if no one's interested, I'm not going to. But I have a feeling I'm going to have a lot of questions. So as the questions come, I will do my best to share what I have learned about it. Again, I'm not an expert at all. I'm just sharing with you what I have found as I've been researching this. Because I think it's important that you, you be given an objective view of what this says. Okay, this is what this says. And it's not about bringing any emotion or making, being uncomfortable about it. This is just about what do they believe? Why do they believe it? And I'm sharing that with you. Okay, and that's it. So resurrection in history. And this is regarding the, the general resurrection. So remember the, the first resurrection, uh, by the full preterist is believed to be the this when the saints came out of their graves and when Jesus ascended that they ascended with him. So the general resurrection is the one that we're going to be reading about now. Jesus promised the resurrection in his disciples' lifetime. So is there any historical record showing it occurred on time? Suppose the saints come from an invisible place, Hades, end up in another hidden place, heaven and are resurrected in spiritual bodies that may or may not be visible. In that case, it is much easier to find a fulfillment in history. Fortunately, a semi-visible event occurred in 66 AD, the same year that angelic armies arrived on the clouds, which is why the, the full preterists do not believe that 66 AD was the time that Jesus returned to usher in the millennial kingdom. 
they believe that 66 AD was the time that Jesus came to resurrect everyone else before the white throne judgment. So it tells us here. When the Jewish revolt began, Nero was in Greece building a canal. Concerning the construction of this waterway, Cassius Dio writes, When the first workers touched the earth, blood spouted from it, groans and bellowings were heard, and many phantoms appeared. Nero himself thereupon grasped a mattock, and by throwing up some of the soil, fairly compelled the rest to imitate him. In recording this event, Suetonius indicates that as Nero broke the ground, the sound of a trumpet was heard. The fact that a trumpet was heard at the time in which the dead appear to have been raised clearly fulfills 1 Corinthians 15.52, for the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised imperishable. Josephus wrote, Chariots and troops of soldiers in their armor were seen running about among the clouds, the clouds and surrounding of cities. Moreover, at that feast, which we call Pentecost, as the priests were going by night into the inner court of the temple, as their custom was, to perform their sacred ministrations, they said that in the first place they felt a quaking and heard a great noise, and after that they heard a sound as of a great multitude saying, Let us remove hence. I'm just going to skip down here because I know that I'm getting long in this video. The above accounts align with the anticipated resurrection. The ground shook, possibly indicating bodies emerging from their graves. Although these bodies were invisible or semi-visible, their voices were heard consistent with the biblical description of resurrection bodies. This event took place two weeks after the vision of angelic armies on the clouds, fulfilling the expectation that the dead would rise when Christ returns. These events unfolded in 66 AD within the generation of the disciples, fulfilling the condition that the resurrection was imminent. It is crucial to recognize that the Bible remains entirely trustworthy, regardless of whether the specific historical event mentioned above or another occurrence represents the timely general resurrection of the dead. Since the Bible promises a resurrection within the lifetime of the disciples, believers can have confidence that it has already taken place. So I'm just going to give you the summary. The Bible teaches three things about the resurrection of the saints. Saints await the general return in Sheol, Hades, until Christ's return. At the resurrection, they rise in heavenly spiritual bodies, which may or may not be visible. They ascend to heaven and dwell there eternally. In 66 AD, a significant event seemed to fulfill the expected resurrection on time, bringing good news. As promised, the resurrection took place within the disciples' lifetime, resulting in a change for Christians. When believers now pass away, they no longer go to Sheol or Hades, but proceed directly to heaven. Revelation 14:13. I heard a voice from heaven saying, Right, blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from now on. Yes, says the Spirit, that they may rest from their labors, for their works follow with them. While heaven was not accessible to those who had not experienced resurrection, believers can find solace in the fact that the resurrection occurred as prophesied within the disciples' generation. This means present-day believers immediately face judgment upon their deaths and may enter heaven without waiting. Understanding what scripture teaches about the resurrection allows believers to embrace the return of Christ with clarity and confidence. However, acknowledging a resurrection raises questions about the millennium reign of Christ as described in Revelation. The millennium involves two resurrections, one at the beginning and another at the end. Exploring these events helps us piece together their place in history. So one other thing that I did see in the comments, I saw someone say that, looking at full preterism like they kind of felt hopeless and I, I do get people in the comments who say that and I'm not understanding where it's coming from because the new heavens we're going to spend an eternity living in the glory of God how is there no hope in that I know that some people have been brought up, you know, to think, okay, I'm going to be raptured 
or I'm going to be part of the heavenly army, or I'm going to be reigning during the millennial kingdom. And they're, they're brought up to believe these things. And I'm not saying that none of them are absolutely going to happen because again, I kind of just try to look into every aspect of things. But when people who are brought up to believe those things hear this, it, it's almost like they're, they feel like they're missing out. But we need to remember that there is no greater glory than living in God's glory. And that is going to happen in the new heaven. And we need to remember that this isn't about us. This isn't about if we were one of the saints that, that reigned during the millennial kingdom. This isn't about if the rapture would ever actually occurred or if it would ever occur. Well, hopefully if it's in the future, we would definitely be a part of it. But if the rapture say did happen in the past, okay, and we weren't here for it, that, that doesn't take anything away from anything. We need to remember, I'm going to reiterate this. This isn't about our glory. This is about the glory of God. And what he is going to give to us in the new heaven, the heaven that we can go to because we have been given that right through salvation, through the work on the cross. How is there no hope in that? If you feel that there's no hope in that, you need to look at things from a different perspective because this isn't about you. This is about the Lord. This is about his glory. And no matter what we feel, his glory is going to stand forever and ever. That's all that I have for you today. If you like this video, give it a thumbs up. If you haven't subscribed yet and would like to hear more of what I have to say, I would love if you would do that. If you have any questions or comments, you can leave one either here or over on Instagram. And if you like my work, you can check out my YouTube membership. I will leave a link in the description box for that as well. And I hope you have a great day.